Hello in 93. I want to preface this video by saying that I am myself a Freemason, but I do not speak for any Grand Lodge. I do not speak for any Lodge. All I speak for is for myself. These are my opinions, my thoughts, and not of any Masonic body. Now, as a Mason, I think that a video like this is needed. A lot of people get interested in Freemasonry. They're curious about it. So they Google it. And one of the first things they run into are all these lies and conspiracy theories about Albert Pike, about morals and dogma. So I want to get into that subject a little bit. First, Albert Pike's morals and dogma was written about the Scottish Rite. Now, the Scottish Rite is not Freemasonry. Freemasonry is a Blue Lodge system. Freemasonry has three degrees, Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. That is Freemasonry. Then you have the appendant bodies, which are other organizations attached in some way to Freemasonry. This includes the York Rite, the Allied Degrees, the Scottish Rite, the Shriners, the Eastern Star. Uh, for kids, you've got De Mole and uh, I think Rainbow Girls and Job's Daughters and such as that. And they're tied some way to Freemasonry. Uh, they have a requirement that either a person be a Master Mason to join or, you know, the kids be relatives somewhat of a Master Mason and such as that. And these bodies, they might have degree systems. And these degree systems do not make the Master Mason any higher rank than he is within Masonry. So you have 4 through 32nd and then with an honorary 33rd degree in Scottish Rite. But... The Master Mason who joins the Scottish Rite and goes through these degrees is still a third degree Master Mason. He's just joined this appendant body and went through these degrees. He's at the same level as a Master Mason in the Blue Lodge. And people misunderstand that because they see, well, you know, Blue Lodge is one through three and this is four through 33. So they must be achieving higher ranks. But no, an appendant body, you're still a Master Mason. You never climb higher. Freemasonry is those three degrees. Now, we don't really know when Freemasonry started. Uh, we've got records going back to the 1300s. They indicate that Freemasonry may have existed in some form through the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. We've got a lot of records in the 1600s. And then in 1717, several Masonic lodges got together and formed a Grand Lodge, the first Grand Lodge that we know of. Then in the 1730s, we start hearing about an additional degree being conferred upon some Master Masons called Scotch Master. And then we get 24 more degrees being added to that. And then in 1801, the Scottish Rite was formed. So you get the idea of this appendant body coming about as a result of Freemasons inventing additional degrees, appendant degrees. And then the 1800s saw the formation of the Northern Jurisdiction and later the Southern Jurisdiction. And the Southern Jurisdiction appointed a man, Albert Pike, to rework all their rights into a good stable form. In 1884, he finished his revision. But before he was finished in 1871, he had finished lectures for these degrees, which he published as Morals and Dogma. And those are his ideas on the degrees, his ideas on Freemasonry. And until 1974, the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction would hand out morals and dogma when you achieve the 14th degree of the Scottish Rite. Now, they stopped that in 1974. Uh, Albert Pike wasn't considered really readable, so they now hand out a bridge to light. Now, the Northern Jurisdiction 
Uh, their rituals were not revised by Albert Pike. Uh, these are two separate bodies, the northern jurisdiction and the southern jurisdiction, dealing with the northern U.S. and southern U.S. So they never really got into handing out morals and dogma because it didn't apply to their rituals because Albert Pike did not revise their rituals. Now, Albert Pike did revise the Blue Lodge first through third degree in Scottish Rite Masonry, and New Orleans is one of the only places where that's performed today. Uh, in most places, you go into Blue Lodge for your for one through three degree, and then you go into the Scottish Rite if you want the Scottish Rite degrees. Now, I think it's important to note that Albert Pike, when he revised the rituals of the Southern Jurisdiction, uh, he had existing rituals to go from. And when he incorporated symbolism or used symbolism that was already incorporated in the rituals, he wasn't inventing his own symbolism. So what Albert Pike was doing when he wrote Morals and Dogma was he was giving his own interpretation of these rituals. And it's important to note that he didn't revise the northern jurisdiction rituals, and his words concerning these rituals don't really apply to the northern jurisdiction, which is probably why they never handed it out. But when you received Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma from your Scottish Rite Lodge, it had preface in it. And this preface was put there by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite. And it was before you got to the book, obviously. And it said, and I'm not going through the whole thing, it's pretty short, but what I really want to concentrate on for this video is the last paragraph. The teachings of these readings are not sacramental so far as they go beyond the realm of morality and to those of other domains of thought and truth. The ancient and accepted Scottish Rite uses the word dogma its true sense of doctrine or teaching and is not dogmatic in the odious sense of that term. Everyone is entirely free to reject and dissent from whatsoever herein may seem to him to be untrue or unsound. It is only required of him that he shall weigh what is taught and give it fair hearing and unprejudiced judgment. Of course, the ancient theosophic and philosophical speculations are not embodied as part of the doctrines of the right, but because it is of interest and profit to know what the ancient intellect thought upon these subjects, and because nothing so conclusively proves the radical difference between our human and the animal nature as the capacity of the human mind to entertain such speculations in regard to itself and the deity. So in other words, the Scottish Rite was saying, these teachings are not our own. These teachings are not inherent in the rite, in the ritual. What these are are the speculations of one man, upon his relationship with deity and mankind's relationship with deity. You're free to disagree. You're free to reject. But this is giving you an example of one man's interpretation of these rites. It may be worth noting that in 2000, the Southern Jurisdiction again revised its ritual and there's some significant differences between it and Albert Pike's revision. So it's obvious that morals and dogma isn't as relevant as it once was. And even when it was relevant, it was not the view of the Scottish Rite. It was one man in the Southern Jurisdiction and his views on the Southern Jurisdiction's ritual. Now, someone may say, you know, this Northern Jurisdiction, Southern Jurisdiction, there's got to be some governing body that ties them both in together. And no, there isn't. And that is an influence of Freemasonry. People like to think of Freemasons as some big whole and that they're united somehow, but that isn't the case. In Freemasonry, you have a fractured system by design. And what it is is local lodges get together and they form a Grand Lodge. And that Grand Lodge has members from all the local lodges. And that Grand Lodge is over one area, a jurisdiction. And the United States, it's a state. So this Grand Lodge of this state is made up of the three main officers from each local lodge in the state. So the Grand Lodge of that state can be seen as a cooperation of all the local lodges, rules that they all agree to live under and such as that. 
So when you go from one local lodge to another, the Grand Lodge rules apply, and you know sort of what to expect when you get there. Now, when a Mason leaves his jurisdiction and goes to another jurisdiction, he may or may not be seen as a Mason there. In Freemasonry, that's called recognition, being recognized as a Mason. And Grand Lodges decide whether they're going to recognize other Grand Lodges as Masons. And they have what they call landmarks or principles of Freemasonry, the core of Freemasonry. And if another jurisdiction does not agree on those landmarks and does not accept those landmarks, then they may not be recognized. For instance, all states in the North recognize Prince Hall Lodges as Masonic Lodges, but the states in the South do not. And a lot of those Northern states have only done so within the last 20 years. So if you are a Prince Hall affiliate in one state and you travel to another state, you may not be seen as a Mason, and you may not be allowed in the lodges. United Grand Lodge of England does not recognize the Grand Orient of France, and many state Grand Lodges do not recognize the Grand Orient of France. So if you're initiated in France and raised as a Master Mason, and you travel to England, or you travel to a U.S. state, you may not be seen as a Mason. And there is no central governing body that says you, you're a Mason here, so you have to be recognized there. It's a voluntary thing. The local Grand Lodge looks at all the criteria, what they consider Freemasonry to be, and looks at your Grand Lodge and sees if they consider the same criteria. And if not, then they may not extend that recognition. And if they do extend that recognition to your Grand Lodge, then they may work together in small amounts, but the Grand Lodges really don't come together like the local lodges do to form a Grand Lodge. So there is no real central government in Freemasonry. And this has influenced the Scottish Rite because they have no unified whole. They have their jurisdictions. And a lot of outsiders see Freemasons as a whole, but it's really not true. We're divided by Grand Lodge, and the Grand Lodges are composed of members of the local lodges. So right off the bat, we've discounted a lot of conspiracy theories uh, just by going into the basics of Freemasonry and the basics of the Scottish Rite and their relationship to each other and such, you realize that a lot of what you've read on the internet is false. It's lies. But there's still one more thing I want to get into. The Taxel hoax. Now, the Taxel hoax, I believe Time Magazine named it one of the top 10 hoaxes of all time. Leo Taxel was a pen name of a man, and he did a hoax. And a lot of the times when you hear Albert Pike being quoted, what you're actually hearing is the Taxel hoax. And Taxel did this hoax and tried to say Masons worship Lucifer and the Masons worship Baphomet. And he did this hoax. And then later on, he admitted, hey, it's just a hoax. Yeah, gotcha. But a hundred years later, people are still running around and believing this hoax that Albert Pike said this and the Masons worship Baphomet and all this, which was part of Taxel's hoax. Now, the most common form of the Taxel hoax that exists today is a quote, that which we must say to the world is that we worship a God, but it is a God that one adores without superstition. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspectors General, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the higher degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai and his priests calumniate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary for light to serve as its full, as a pedestal is necessary to the statue, and the break to the locomotive. Thus the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy, and the true and pure philosophical religion is a belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. 
that is a hoax. Albert Pike never said that, and Leo Taxel admitted he made it up. They also take a quote of Albert Pike's, a legitimate quote, and they take it out of context. And I'm going to read from the 19th chapter of Morals and Dogma and give the real context. The apocalypse is, to those who receive the 19th degree, the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps and works of Lucifer. Lucifer the light bearer. Strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations, and inspiration is not of one age nor of one creed. Plato and Philo also were inspired. Now it's important to note the word Lucifer here. Lucifer is a Latin name. It is in the King James Version of the Bible. It is not in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is Hillel, which was their name for the star of the morning. When the priests translated the text into the Latin Vulgate, they used their name for the star of the morning, Lucifer. Lux means light, and Ifer means to bring, like an aquifer brings water. So Lucifer literally means in Latin, light bringer. And that's the only place it occurs in the King James Version, and it doesn't occur in the Hebrew, so it's not a name. What they were talking about is a star in the morning sky. So Albert Pike was saying Lucifer is a strange name to give to the spirit of darkness. Light bringer, or light bearer, the sun of the morning. So why would you give this name to Satan? Is this really a name of Satan? And Albert Pike says, well, yeah, it is, because people are blinded by the light. Weak, sensual minds are pompous in their own self-knowledge and self-importance, in their own ego about how much they know and how scholarly they are, and they forget God. So in that aspect, yeah, Lucifer is a light bearer. He blinds sensual and feeble men to God. And that's what he's saying. So I hope that through showing you some of this stuff, you're able to understand the context of morals and dogma, and you're able to see some of the conspiracy theories and lies for the lies they are. Thank you in 93.